Hey everyone, Relic here. I've got a pretty exciting update on the Pico Prom to share with you today. But first, I'd like to give a huge thanks to everyone who's watched the original video, subscribed to the channel, and better yet, purchased one of the Pico Prom kits for themselves. One of the primary goals of this channel is just to create cool gizmos and share them with the world. Even though I'm located here in the United States, it's been incredibly humbling to have people throughout the Americas and Europe and elsewhere be interested enough in this project to put in their order from overseas. Pretty awesome stuff. On top of that, I've been trying my best to answer any and all questions related to this project. If you run into any troubles or are just looking for general information, please go ahead and shoot me a message over via my email or through Tindy or put in an issue over on the GitHub repository. I'll make it a priority to get back with you as soon as I can. Okay, enough of that garbage. I've got a lot to talk about today, so let's go ahead and get started. The first firmware that I released for this device, version 0.22, was heavily based on the foundation that the original author, George Foote, laid out with only minor modifications and additions where necessary to allow reading, verifying, and transmitting ROM images. However, in order for this project to expand further, I really need to get in there on the ground level and rework the entire structure of the software. These changes don't make a huge difference on the surface, but they lead into the next big batch of updates that I'd like to share. At the moment, you still need to connect with the device over a UART terminal. In all the examples that I'll be including in this video, I'll be using Minicom on a Linux environment. If you need any help getting that set up, I recommend watching the first video on the Pico Prom linked in the description below. The steps to getting connected should generally be the same. The first difference you'll notice is that instead of starting into the state in which the device is ready to receive ROM data over X modem right from the get-go, we are instead presented with a main menu. Some of these items will seem familiar, but there are a number of new options which may spark some interest. While we're on the topic of Xmodem, I've actually split this functionality into a new repository that is acting as a sub-module library for PicoProm. I'll leave a link to that library in the video description if anyone is interested in adding this feature to transmit files back and forth with a computer over UART in their own project. Okay, let's get to business. Uh, let's start by first attempting to read an image. I've got a 28C256 already connected to the device, so we shouldn't need to change any settings here since that is the default. All you need to do is type in the character R to enter that command. I will add that in the current command prompt routine is a bit sensitive to input. I would make sure to be very deliberate with your input. Although if you do happen to type in a wrong entry, it will prompt you and allow you to try again. The keen eye among you may notice that the read process is slightly slower in this new implementation, but the difference is very minor and I'm still very happy with the performance. Now here's where the goods come in. The next option it will ask you is to choose how you'd like to receive that data that was just read from the device. Instead of relying solely on Xmodem to transfer data to and from the computer, I've added the incredibly awesome LittleFS library and turned a portion of the onboard flash of the Raspberry Pi Pico into a functional file system. This gives us one megabyte of onboard storage on the original Pico, which could potentially be expanded for other RP2040 based boards with more QSPY flash storage, but I digress. The current implementation of this file system is a bit on the simple side without support for subdirectories or USB mass storage, but I think it's definitely good enough to get the job done. So let's go ahead and give it a try. Type in S to select flash storage, then a basic file name prompt is presented. Currently, I don't have too many hard specifications for the formatting of file names. It does do some simple validation, but I would be careful about entering in any weirdness in this field. For now, let's just call it test.bin. Technically, the file extension is not required, but I think it's nice to have. Also, uh, be warned, if there is a file already available with the same file name, it will be overwritten with this new ROM image. Anyway, just enter that in and it should take you back to the main menu after confirming the right process. As an aside, whenever a command menu has the option Q to return or leave empty to quit, you can just quit the current action and go back to the previous menu by following the corresponding action. Okay, okay, that's cool and all. Where did a file go? Let's find out. Type in F in the main menu to enter the Manage Files menu. You'll notice that all the available files on the device will be listed out along with their size and kilobytes. And there's our file, test.bin, ready to go. Pretty cool. Since this ROM image is now stored locally on the Pico Prom, you can do lots of things with it. Within the file management menu, you can transfer it over to your computer for an extra copy or even just delete it, of course. But back in the main menu, you can select it to write to another ROM chimp or verify its contents against a different chip without writing over that chip. In the future, I'll probably add more utilities to this interface, such as file renaming and directory management. 
So let's call this a bit of a beta feature for the moment. In fact, if you run into any difficulties with the files on your Pico prompt or just want to wipe the system clean, you can use the format command to remove all files and rebuild the file system. Let's try to put this new feature to some good use. I've already got my ROM image on the device ready to go, so I'll go ahead and grab another 28C256 EEPROM and swap it out in the zip socket. Then in the main menu, I'm going to write W to write to the chip and type S to select flash storage. Our test.bin file is now listed to pull from. I'm going to type in zero to select that file and a drum roll please. Voila! We successfully copied over an EEPROM chip without sending it back and forth through our computer. Pretty sweet. Okay, okay, I get what you're saying. Let's move on to the next cool feature. I'm gonna jump into the settings menu by typing S. A lot of this should look familiar, but now notice how it says category above the selected device. Well, now type in C to change device categories. And what's that? Atari 2600? Check this out. I've put together a really simple passive adapter, which allows you to plug a standard Atari cartridge into the Pico from. First, put the adapter in the ZIF socket and lock it in. You'll need to be cautious to ensure that it's plugged in correctly. I've added an IC marker to the PCB to indicate the correct orientation. Then you can plug in the cartridge you'd like to read straight into the card edge connector. I've created a 3D printed case for this peripheral to ensure that the cartridge is facing the right way and to open the inner door of the original Atari cartridges. But if you use the bare adapter, make sure that the front of the cartridge is facing to the right, away from the rest of the Pico Prom. You may have to manually open the cartridge door as well, but I won't get to that in this video. At the moment, only two cartridge types are supported, simple 2K and 4K cartridges. Four kilobytes was the original maximum size of Atari cartridges, so games like Pong and Tank are likely gonna fit into one of these types. However, most games released after the original lineup use bank switching to expand upon this limit. I haven't yet done the research into how to best support this, but it's on the roadmap for a future release. And I'm not sure if I really need to say this, but these cartridges are obviously read-only. All commands that require write functionality will not work when this device is selected. So let's put this adapter to some good use. I've got a cartridge here for my game Spiderweb, which I know is a four kilobyte image. I'm gonna change that option by using the D key. Then let's go back to the main menu by typing Q. And I'm gonna start the read process by typing R. Since I wanna send this ROM file over to my computer, I'm gonna type X to use X modem. Now let's start up the XMODEM transfer by using the key combo, Control A, Z, then select receive file by pressing R. Go down and press enter on the XMODEM option and type the desired file name and press enter. For now, I'm gonna use vcs-spider underscore ntsc.bin for this particular ROM file. Our transfer should be successful if all goes well. Now here's the cool part. I'm gonna open up my emulator of choice, let's say Stella in this case, navigate to my ROM file and open it up. If all went well, you should now be playing your copy of the Atari 2600 game. By the time that you're watching this video, I should have this little adapter for sale on my Tindy store for you to back up your collection of Atari games using the Pico Prom. However, keep in mind that most games will not likely be supported until I update the firmware to support bank switching. Well, the Atari is cool and all, but it's really just a stepping stone for future device support. I do have plans to support more cartridge types, but I'm not quite there yet to reveal exactly where I'm headed. If you'd like to follow this project and find out when I've added more cartridge support, go ahead and subscribe to my channel or star the Pico Prom repository on GitHub linked below. Now there's one last big update that I'd like to cover before we close out. If you return to the main menu and press T, you'll enter the new tools menu. If you're just looking to quickly wipe a chip or test your chip to make sure that all the data and dress lines are working properly, these new commands should make that process much easier to go about rather than creating test ROM file images from scratch on your computer that exactly match with the specifications of your device. You can write all zeros or all one values to the device by pressing either the zero or one key, write randomly generated data by pressing two, or write the current 8-bit address index for each byte by pressing 3. For all these commands, except for random writes, the program will verify the data on the chip after it completes the write process, just as if it would if you're writing a normal image. Let's go ahead and try the address index option, which should give us a clear example of how this works. I've selected that option and the chip looks like it's all good to go. Let's go back to the main menu and use the read page command to read the first page of 64 bytes. 
great, the data looks good. We could keep going to check each page, but I'm pretty confident that if the full write verification has succeeded, we're good to go. Quick note here, I've included an option to perform a chip erase on your device that isn't actually implemented in the current firmware. This is a function unique to EEPROM devices that will quickly erase all data on the chip. For now, you can use the tool command which will write all zeros to the chip to achieve similar results, but I do plan on adding this feature soon. Well, that just about covers everything in the new firmware, version 0.23. I hope y'all enjoy all the new features, and if there's anything y'all would like to see in the next update, please leave a comment below about it, and I'll see what I can do. Or better yet, don't be afraid to get your hands dirty and try contributing directly to the project on GitHub. I'd love to see what other coders are able to do with this platform. Anyway, anyway, that's all for now. Please feel free to check out my Tendi store and order a Pico Prom for yourself. Maybe throw in the new Atari adapter while you're at it. If you like the kind of content that I make, go ahead and give this video a like and subscribe to my channel for future updates and other fun videos. Have a great rest of your day and whatever you do, don't stop making. Sorry, I guess that's like become my tagline now. I don't know, I can't think of anything better. Let me know in the comments below if you can think of a good catchphrase for me because I don't know what to say. <laughs> anyway, y'all have a great day. Hi everyone, uh, quick update here. I hate to do this, uh, but this video took forever to put out because I kind of pushed it to the side. Um, but since this, we've actually released version 0.24 already, uh, which has a, a couple of, you know, um, ease of use options added to it. Uh, but more importantly, it even has a, a new adapter has been added. Oh, it is a mask ROM adapter. Lovely. This will also be on my 10D store. Um, but I was uh, debugging some Commodore stuff over here, as you can probably tell. And um, I ran into an issue where one of my ROM chips was bad, but I didn't know which one. And I was like, hey, I can use the Pico Prom to do this. Uh, and so I kind of rigged one up real quickly. So I just kind of proto board one together, um, you know, a few bodge wires and stuff, but it worked okay. Uh, and so I was like, hey, might as well just add this to the list of things. Um, anyway, so it's good for, you know, diagnosing ROMs on vintage computers. It's very easy and there's a new category on the device for that. Thank you. Uh, sorry for the addendum at the end, but uh, have a great day.